For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jason Mercer. I'm one of the elders. Um, periodically, we have the honor and the privilege to, and the responsibility to bring the word forth um, when Mitch has been away. And we thank God for his safe return. And uh, as I started preparing this week um, for the sermon, I had really no idea of the events that would occur, but I felt led um, not necessarily to do an expository uh, sermon, but more of a topical sermon, which turned out to be pretty appropriate based on everything that's happened in the last week. Um, today we're going to discuss the providence of God in the lives of men, and particularly um, in the lives of believers. Um, in this world today, people face times of uncertainty. This can lead to fear and anxiety. We worry about finances, politics, families, jobs, and our country. And the world around us builds up this narrative to create a uh, worry in us. It's human nature to want to be in control. When we don't, we, we turn to a myriad of different things to create the illusion of control. We place our hope and trust in worldly things and seek advice and leadership from men and women who seem to have it all together, but really, they don't. Most men and women refuse to believe that there's a higher being who has created all things and personally directs his creations. Even when they are willing to consider that there is a creator, they cannot or will not understand the truth that there is a sovereign God who is the creator and sustainer of all things. In the world today, there are four basic common errors about considering the origin of all things and why events occur. There's the first of which is randomness. This means that all things occur by random chance. This is a commonly held atheistic view of all things. It says that all things were created by random chance and are sustained and occur because of random chance. There's no direction to creation nor the events within creation. There's no singular purpose and no defined end. There's also fate, which is a belief of those who are willing to admit that there's some higher authority or power that directs the events of everything. This um, impersonal force that affects the events of creation um, is not a person, not a being, but just a, an energy or a force. It predetermines the path of each part of creation in the event and the events that will ultimately occur. There's also pantheism. This is the belief that when people are willing to admit that there's a higher being who created all things, whether through direct creation or whether through starting the process of evolution. The key component of this belief is that creation and this other being that we'll, they'll sometimes call God um, have, are, there's no distinct difference or a separate identity between them. They are one and the same. So we can say that this table, God is in this table, and this table is God. The same thing goes to be said, and it satisfies the pride of men, is to say that God is in every man, and every man is God. And lastly, there's deism. Now, deism is a concept that teaches that God created all things. And after he got done creating all things, he, he abandoned it. He let it all work its way out without any direction or supervision. So we now know what the world sees as how, why things occur um, every day. But let's turn our attention to what we as Christians know is the truth. We as Christians are to understand creation and the cause for all events through the eyes of Scripture. The Bible declares the sovereignty of God in all things. His sovereignty is the result of his attributes of omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, and eternity. If we truly understand the nature of God, then we realize that he's the creator of all things, and he's aware of and has continued oversight and control over all of his creation from the smallest to the largest detail. When we discuss this truth, we're speaking about the doctrine of the providence of God. The understanding of this doctrine, like all of Christianity, is enabled by the indwelling Holy Spirit, who reveals the truth to the believer. The world rejects this doctrine. Why aren't we surprised that they do? 
Well, Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Unregenerate man cannot discern the spiritual things of God. They have rejected God as creator of all things and therefore reject him um, that in that he continues to sustain and direct all things. Christians who ascribe to the truth of the doctrines of grace are willing to accept the sovereignty of God and the salvation of man. However, there are many Christians who may still believe in the sovereign, uh, sovereignty of God in election. However, they have difficulty accepting the sovereignty of God in every aspect of our lives. There's still that basic human pride component that does not want to accept that we don't have self-determination. Scripture, however, clearly declares the sovereignty of, sovereignty of God in all things. Now, I, I, as we go forward here, I think we all can agree that salvation is the greatest sovereign work of God in the lives of men. Therefore, I will, I'm not going to discuss God's role in, in salvation this morning, but I'm going to look at how God exerts his providence over the lives of his people, in particular his believers. So when we speak of providence of God, what do we mean? It's defined as the continual involvement of God in all created things in such a way that it keeps them existing in a manner uh, consistent with the properties in which he existed, I'm sorry, he created them. He works through his created things in every action, directing their distinctive properties to, to cause them to act as they do, and he directs them to fulfill his purpose. Now, the term providence comes from Latin words meaning um, to uh, see before. Now, we have to be careful when we see those, that definition because it can be misinterpreted as foresight or preparation for the future. We know that God does not look down the corridors of time and see something's going to happen and then say, I need to prepare for it. Instead, we know that God creates the future because he causes all things to come to pass. We know that the future is the future because he wills it to be. In order to truly understand God's providence and creation, we must understand that God is continually present in all of his creation. However, he transcends his creation. What do we mean by that? One of the God's uh, main attributes is omnipresent. He is present in all of his creation at every moment and in every physical place. Because he's always present in all his creation, he can direct every aspect of it. Psalm 139, 7 through 12. Um, David speaks of the omnipresence of God in all of creation. And he says, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I free from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make a bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. So although God is present in his creation, he's distinct from his creation. He's not limited by his creation temporally or spatially. God transcends his creation, which means that he's infinitely greater than anything that he created, and he's not limited by the rules of creation. Although he is in creation, he and creation are not the same. That would fall back into the, the understanding of deism. The transcendent nature of God differs from the nature of creation. Creation moves linearly through time. We have today becomes yesterday, and tomorrow becomes today. It, time never stops, and it never goes backward. Creation changes constantly as time goes by, but God does not change. He's eternal, he's immutable, he never changes, and God does not exist within our time, but he exists outside or above time. And the Bible tells us that God is not subject to time. 2 Peter 3.8 says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. God does not experience time like we do. He's eternal and outside of time. 
And also, creation exists and occupies space. God does not occupy space. He has no physical form, therefore he cannot occupy space. But we're told in scriptures that God is greater than any space as, as well. He cannot be contained. Solomon understood how great the God, as God was and that he could not be contained in space. In 2 Chronicles 2.16, Solomon speaks of the a building of the temple of God. And it, he says, But who is able to build him a house, since heaven, even highest heaven, cannot contain him? Who am I to build a house for him except as a place to make offerings before him. So the discussion of providence of God is a huge topic, and we could spend months going over all the aspects of it. Today I'm going to focus on the providence of God in the lives of believers. And when I started working on this sermon, I had no idea of all the events that would occur this week with this um, storm that radically changed the lives of men and women throughout the southeastern United States, throughout um, indirectly through the whole country and even the world. The storm and destruction did not occur without God knowing about it. He was not taken by surprise. So my aim is to show that no matter what happens that in the lives of believers, we can understand that God is in control, that there's a biblical basis for this doctrine of the providence of God. It, and it means that the lives of believers and how we are as Christians um, should should be affected and, and influenced by the fact that we know that God is in control. So when we talk about the providence of God, we speak of three common aspects. One is preservation, the second is what they call concurrence, and lastly, government. So what do we mean by preservation? It means that God keeps all created things existing and maintaining the properties with which he created them. To understand preservation, we much, must first consider creation. In order to understand the doctrine of providence of God, we must understand and believe in the creation account that's in Genesis. We know that the world denies the truth that God created all things in six days. However, it's even more amazing to how many Christians deny that today. It has been dismissed as a metaphor or just a fairy tale meant for children and simple-minded individuals. The truth that God created all things in six days is essential because if God did not create all things, he does not have the power to preserve them. But we know that he did. He created all things through his son, Jesus Christ. And John 1, 1, 3 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was not made. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And John 1, 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we know that God created all things. So he has the authority and power to, to sustain and preserve all things. But when we, what do we mean by God uh, sustaining all things? He expresses his sovereignty over all things by sustaining all creation at every minute of every day. Since our discussion today is focusing on the providence of God in the lives of believers, we will focus on God sustaining and preserving man as part of his creation. We know that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, created all things and, but he is also responsible for sustaining all that was created, including mankind. If you turn with me, please, to Hebrews 1.3. And it reads, Long ago and many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now these verses are part of the opening of the epistle to the Hebrews. In the first three verses, God lays out the identity of Jesus Christ. He wanted to make it clear to the readers that Jesus Christ was more than a man and a prophet. 
As you may recall from our previous study with Pastor Mitch about the um, epistle uh, to the Hebrews, that the main theme was that Christ is greater than. And they went through multiple things that Christ was greater than. So the author states with this, in these statements that who Christ really is. In verse 2, the author identifies Christ as the creator of all things. Now this goes back to our, uh, my statements before. In order for Christ to be um, the sustainer of all things, he needs to have been the creator of all things. This declares his power and authority for what is then stated in verse 3, which says he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The word translated uphold is pharaoh, which means to carry or to bear. This is the same word that was used in Luke 5.18 when the friends of the paralyzed man, man carried him on the stretcher to see Jesus. It indicates an active, purposeful control over things that are being carried from one place to another. And its tense indicates an ongoing action. So this verse could actually be um, uh, translated as, he is continually carrying along all things in creation. Jesus Christ, who, is, who had the power and authority to create all things, is actively involved in sustaining creation as it moves along through space and time. All creation came to be through the power of, the, of God through his son, Jesus Christ. This includes the creation of man. God created the first man, Adam, in his own image. He created him and to have fellowship with him. Then God made the statement that it was not good for man to be alone, so he created Eve, the first woman, to be a helpmate for Adam. From that moment on, when God created Adam and then ultimately Eve, that, and all the people for, who would follow from that time were preserved by God. Scripture tells us that man continues to exist because of the will of God. It even tells us that we rely on God for our next breath. Isaiah 42.5 quotes the Lord and says, Thus says God the Lord, Who created the heavens and stretched them out? Who spread out the earth and who comes from it? Who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it? God is creator and sustainer of all things down to the very next breath that we take and that every living creature takes. Since Christ sustains all of creation, then we realize that if Christ were to stop and withdraw his power of, uh, over creation, then everything would stop existing except for God, because God is the only uncreated thing. Every aspect of life of man is sustained by Christ. So we talked about that God, uh, that God uh, preserves us through his um, providence. Next, we're going to talk about concurrence. Now, this term can also be called cooperation. This aspect of the providence of God states that God works in and through his creation, both things that are alive and, and inanimate objects, to cause them to act as they do according to the properties and laws by which they were created. This differs from the performing of miracles, which is God's directing a part of his creation to act in a way that's not consistent with its usual properties. Although usually not as dramatic as miracles, the providence of God is just as import, uh, important and much more common in the lives of men. A simple example of concurrence can be seen if you were to take and examine a rock. You hold a rock in your hand, it's hard and it's heavy. Now God created this rock as part of a mountain. Now God puts this rock on the edge of a cliff and it falls. It falls because of the will of God. Now that rock travels down from the mountain and there's a car driving by with a glass windshield. That rock hits the windshield and shatters the windshield. This is all, the, by, this is all part of what they call concurrence. God created the rock, the hard rock, the heavy rock, and it made, he made it fall. It fell as it should. It didn't float up, but it fell down. And it, it did what it was supposed to do. So. God is acting on his creation, causing it to act according to the properties he gave it. So in our discussion today, we're going to talk more about how the aspects of God's providence is used in the lives of mankind. So look at the lives of men and women, and we can say that every aspect of our lives have been planned out by God, and he uses other parts of his creation 
to direct our lives. This includes our deaths, our births, our words, our steps, our movements, our hearts, and our abilities and talents. But before getting into specific ways in which God uses his creation to direct the lives of men, we must first address the topic of how he does this. We must understand the, uh, how God exerts his providence by defining the causes of things. There is a primary cause and a secondary cause. The primary cause of all things is the will of God. It is God's initiative to will something to occur that precedes any action on the part of his creation to accomplish that. Without this primary cause, there, nothing would happen. This is not visible to the naked eye, and it, it comes from the will of God himself. God, who is the primary cause, exerts his sovereign influence on his creation to manifest a secondary cause. The secondary cause is when uh, is the cause that can be explained when we examine things through the eyes of science or nature or the properties of the creation. The working of God's creation occurs in a manner consistent with the properties with which he endowed it to bring about the expected results. So let's talk about something very topical. How about the hurric Hurricane Michael? What was the primary cause of Hurricane Michael? It was the will of God. Why did it occur? Only God knows. His will is his will. But the secondary cause is what the, re is what the majority of mankind is, is seeing, which is it looks like it's a product of nature. So in the tropical convergence zone over the Western Caribbean, there formed a low pressure system that became a tropical cyclone. It moved into the Gulf of Mexico because of the prevailing winds, strengthened due to the warm sea surface temperatures, and then came ashore and caused massive destruction. So you look at that, the world would say, this was nature, and it's an act of nature. Um, they may even say periodically, it's an act of God, but they really don't mean it. Um, they're thinking that the primary cause was nature just occurred. But we as Christians know that everything that occurs in the lives of men has an invisible primary cause that comes from the will of God. This leads to the secondary cause, that fulfills the intent of God through the working of his creation. So how does God specifically work his providence in the lives of men? Well, first of all, there's conception. God is involved in every moment of every life, even including at the very moment of the creation of that life. Um, conception of a child is a truly work of divine providence. It reflects harmony between the direction and will of God and the ordinary operation of nature as God designed it. Psalm 127.3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. The fact that two cells came together to form one cell, then multiplied into millions of cells to form a, hu a, a full-size human being, or a small human being initially, um, and each one of those cells acts independently Yet many of them work cooperatively to perfectly work to function every aspect of a human body is just truly astounding. God is intricately involved in the formation of a new human life within the womb. And David makes it clear that the sovereignty of God is present in the formation of a child in Psalm 139, 13, which says, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. So God is intricately involved in the life, every life, even from the earliest stages. So then God also uses his creation to, to provide for mankind. This includes feeding, clothing, and sheltering. He causes crops to grow. He causes trees to bear fruit. He causes the trees to grow to provide the lumber to make our homes. He gives us plants and animals that we can use materials to make our clothing. So let's turn to Luke 12, 22, and tw uh, I'm sorry, 22 through 31. And it says, And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? 
And which of you, being, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of your life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the, clothed the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will, will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. If you have an ESV translation um, of the Bible, this section is often called, Do Not Be Anxious. Jesus tells the disciples, and he's also telling us through these words, that we have the assurance that the Father will provide. Jesus says that we are not to worry about what we eat, what we wear, and about the length of our lives. He uses the example of God giving the food to the ravens who neither sow nor reap. Here in the U.S., we often don't have to worry about get it, are we going to be able to eat. The biggest concern we have is where we're going to go eat after church. But in most of the world, there are people who wake up each day wondering will they have the resources or will they be able to gather enough to feed their families. But God provides to each person according to their need and according to his will. Jesus is saying that if God, the Father, provides for the ravens who are just not very pretty nuisance birds who are scavengers, how much more will he provide for those people who he has called to himself? He then says if God, that God, if God clothes the lilies in their, all their beauty and the grass which will die and be burned up, we can certainly be sure that he will provide for us who are of much greater value. Remember, our value to God does not depend on who we are or what we've done, but on the price that was paid for, to set us free, the life of his son, Jesus Christ. And finally, Jesus mentions not to worry about our bodies. This doesn't mean we are to neglect our health, but instead, he says that no amount of worry will add a single minute to your life. Our days have been ordained by God from the beginning of time. And Psalm 139, 16 says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. So although our days are numbered by God, how we live can affect how we can actually function day to day. If we aren't to neglect our health, but we are to um, try to live in a healthy manner so that we can physically do more and enjoy the life that God has given. As a physician, I tell my patients that no matter what I do, I cannot increase the, day, the uh, length of their life at all, for God has ordained each one a certain length of life. But my goal is to help them to be as healthy and as active as they can until that day. I think as Christians, that's our responsibility. And Jesus ends by saying that the focus of the believer is to be on the kingdom of God. We are to do this first, and God will provide the necessities of life. The ultimate necessity of life is Jesus Christ. What, you know, what's the benefit of living a long, healthy life, wearing beautiful clothes, and having a full belly, but then dying without Jesus Christ? So as Christians, are we to sit around and wait for manna to fall from heaven? Of course not. We are to live our lives working to provide for our families and for ourselves. Without, and without his directing will, we would not be able to provide food and to sustain our lives. So God directs our steps and we are to follow them. When Jesus taught the disciples the Lord's Prayer, he even affirmed there that there, we have a reliance on God for our basic necessities when he taught them to say, give us this day our daily bread. So even though we go to work each day to earn the money to buy our food, or in other cases, work in the farm or work with animals to get food, God is ultimately the one who provides all things. The next we're going to consider is how the provid God's providential care directs our actions. Now, God exerts his sovereign will on the hearts and minds of men and women to influence their actions. 
This, again, is the primary cause of everything that we do. It's essential as Christians to realize that our lives are controlled by the sovereign will of a loving God who has promised that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He promises to keep us and preserve us, and he will complete the good work that he began in us. Scripture clearly declares God's sovereign direction on the actions of men. In Acts 17, uh, 17, 28, it says, In him we live and move. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 10, 23 says, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not of himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. And Proverbs 20, 24 says, A man's steps are ordered by the Lord. So turn with me to Philippians 2, 13. This, and this verse says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This verse addresses the working of God in the heart of the believer through the Holy Spirit. When a man's heart is regenerated, he's able to see the sin that he has and the need for a Savior. It is then that the person will call out in the name of Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. Once a man or a woman is saved, the process of sanctification begins. This is the conforming of the believer into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Through the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the person can recognize and hate the residual sin within him or her. This hatred of sin drives sanctification within the believer. The Holy Spirit gives us the will of God to want to overcome this sin. We have the ability because we are no longer slaves to sin but have been set free through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the good pleasure of Christ, that we continue to overcome sin in, the lives, uh, in our lives and progress in our sanctification. Now, God not only uses ourselves, but he uses other people to influence and direct our actions. Whether it's someone who God sent to share the gospel with us, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who work to encourage us in our sanctification, hold us accountable, encourage us as we go through this Christian life, or whether it's a godly spouse who he gives us, or whether it's a godly parents who shared the word of God with us and the truths of God as we grew up. God has brought these people into our lives to accomplish his will for us. Even people who bring negative influences into our lives are, uh, serve God's purpose as well. These can be temptations that we resist and temptations to which we yield, resulting in sin. All of these people are brought into our lives under the providence of God. He uses them to bring us to salvation and to progress us in sanctification. Even when we yield to evil influences and sin, God has made us a promise that if we confess our sin and repent, that he is faithful to forgive us. Even a season of wandering from God can lead to a closer walk with him when a true believer repents and is restored. This would be a good time right now to discuss that God never leads a person or causes a person to sin. God cannot cause evil or sin because it's contrary to his nature. Man, however, even after salvation, has a sin nature. Although after salvation we are freed from the power of sin, we still have the presence of sin in in us. When we are tempted, at times we will give way and fall prey to its influence. God will allow man to sin and do evil if it ultimately accomplishes his will. God allows man to sin, but he himself never causes it. So we've, we've discussed that the providence of God works in conception, in the, providing the necessities of life for men and women and influences our actions. Um, and now we turn to how God directs our successes, failures, good times, and bad times. Any success or failure that a person has is from God. We tend to think that only successes are gifts and failures are punishments. The truth is that God has a plan for each one of us that includes seasons of success and those of failure. Each season serves a role to accomplish his will in our lives. So how can this be? Well, first of all, we never need to try to interpret the intent of God in the circumstances in which we're in. Success does not always indicate favor. 
he may at times allow us to succeed in pursuits that are worldly, worldly to allow us to fall into sin and wander away for a season. But, this, but ultimately, it will lead to re, uh, repentance and restoration and can actually bring about a sweeter, closer fellowship with God. Conversely, failure doesn't always indicate that God is, is chastising us. He may ordain something to fa- fail in order to keep us close to him, thereby protecting us from our tendency to fall back into our sinful ways. Failures will often refocus the hearts and minds of believers back to God and away from the world. This is an expression of the love of God, and, and he loves us enough to allow us to fail. If we are allowed only to succeed, we are at risk of forgetting from whom our fortunes come. This can lead to the conceit of man. We are told repeatedly in Scripture that the children of God will not be protected from trials and tribulations. During times of ease, it's easy to feel as if we do not need to rely on God. However, in times of trials and tribulations, we draw closer to him for strength and guidance. Consider what happened this week. How many people do you think called out to God for preservation and rescue during the storm that occurred this week? People who may not have considered God or may have wandered away from God for years. How many people now realize the fragility of a life focused on material things that were there one minute and gone another? So in a time such as this, there are, more, there's, there are likely many who have turned back to the Lord after years of wandering and neglecting him. Times of trials and tribulations and circumstances also change and heal relationships. There are opportunities for people of God to show the love and compassion of Christ for their fellow man through a helping hand to family, friends, neighbors, and even strangers. This can include sharing the gospel. These are times when people are more open to the gospel because of all the idolatry of this world has been has been taken away. So not only can Christians share our message verbally, but also we we show the love of Christ and the the genuineness of the regenerate heart when we serve other people during these times to bring them relief. The, The same thing can be said about times of illness. God's people get sick just like everyone else. God brings physicians into the lives of of people who, under his guidance, can heal people. But at other times, God does not provide the healing. We, however, should respond the same way no matter whether we're healed or not. We are to express our love for God and our trust in him as a great physician. We draw closer to him in prayer as we ask for healing, which he might do. However, if he chooses not to, we still express our love and devotion to him because he alone is sovereign over all things and knows what's best for us. And it's a, it also serves a purpose to, uh, to demonstrate our love for him and how we are different than the world who gets angry and frustrated when things don't go our way. And uh, the next thing we're going to consider is our talents and abilities and how God has provided them. Any talent or ability we have comes from God. He has given them to us to use for his purpose and his will. To think otherwise is prideful and is a sin. When we do not acknowledge God as the giver of every good thing and do not use what he has given us to accomplish his will and to give him glory, then we're wasting the talents and abilities that he's given us. God gives each person specific talents and abilities, and he brings people together with complementary talents and abilities to fulfill his will. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. This reads, there is one body, but it has many parts, but all its many parts make up one body. It is the same with Christ. 
we were all baptized by one Holy Spirit, and so we are formed into one body. It didn't matter whether we were Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free people. We were all given the same spirit to drink. So the body is not made up of just one part. It has many parts. Suppose the foot says, I am not a hand, so I do not belong to the body. But by saying this, it cannot stop being part of the body. And suppose the ear says, I'm not an eye, so I don't belong to the body. By saying this, it cannot stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, how could it hear? If the whole body were an ear, how could it smell? God has placed each part in the body just as he wanted it to be. If all the parts were the same, how could there be a, a body? As it is, there are many parts, but there is only one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The hand can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, it's just the opposite. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are the ones that we can't do without. The parts that we think are less important, we treat with special honor. The parts aren't, the parts aren't shown, I'm sorry, um, the parts aren't shown, but they are treated with special care. The parts that can be shown don't need special care. But God has put together all the parts of the body, and he has given more honor to the parts that didn't have it. In that way, the parts of the body will, take not, will not take sides. All of them will take care of one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part shares its joy. You are the body of Christ. Each one of you is part of it. The people of God are, are to come together within the body of the church willingly offering their talents and abilities to fulfill the will of God for the church and to serve one another. Individual talents should not be a source for boasting or conceit because these are gifts from God. He has perfectly given each one of us our abilities and talents, and he has put us in this exact place at this exact time so that we can serve him in the way that he wants us to serve and to serve each other. So we are not to ever consider our talents with pride. And another way God influences the lives of believers is through influencing the decisions and actions of rulers of nations. God is sovereign over all of his creation, including the rulers of nations. Proverbs 21, one said, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he, he will. God directs the lives of men by his sovereignty over decisions and actions of the leaders of, their, his, of our nations. God uses these leaders to accomplish his will. We have seen in scripture how God changes the hearts of rulers to either bring favor to uh, his people or to bring punishment to his people. He more often influences them subtly by influencing their thoughts and, the, uh, and the, their hearts instead of dramatically, like when he took Nebuchadnezzar and made him act like a beast for years. Examples in scriptures are when God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. God hardened the heart of Pharaoh against the request from Moses to, uh, to free the Israelites from Egypt. This led to the ten plagues that were set upon Egypt. These plagues ultimately led to the release of the Jews from slavery, but they also served God's purpose in revealing his power and his glory before the greatest empire in the world at that time. The word of his, the power of God spread throughout the entire known world. And as the Israelites encountered different nations, the glory of God and the power of God was already known and brought fear when, they, when these other nations dealt with the uh, Israelites. So in a world of idol worship, where there was a, the one true God who had no name and had no physical representation was feared more than every idol and God that was out there in the world. So it's essential that believers realize the sovereignty, sovereignty of God in ruling of nations and politics. Many Christians follow politics um, of our country and of the world and become upset and anxious. They see the way our country is abandoning Judeo-Christian beliefs and values and become upset about it. 
we must remember that God is ultimately in charge. We will have a president and a government that God wants us to have. This could be for a blessing, or it could be for our chastisement. And I'll let each of you decide where we are at this point. <laughs> we are not to be anxious over national world events, because everything will occur according to the will of God. The lives of believers all over the world are affected by their leaders and the politics of their nations. Many Christians today are in, under intense persecution from their national leaders. Christianity, though, has continued to grow in these areas more than in the areas where Christianity is more accepted. So even when men plot against the word of God, his will will be done, and he will call, his, call people to him through the testimony of the gospel. So now we've looked at preservation and concurrence as the two aspects of the, um, God's providence. The last one is government. This means that God has a purpose in all that he does in the world, and he providentially governs and directs all things in order that it will be accomplished. Isaiah 46.10 says, Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all of my purpose. Providence works in the lives of men to fulfill the perfect will and purpose of God. There's nothing that can prevent God from accomplishing his will because he's sovereign over all things. So before we broach the subject of God's will or purpose, we must understand two categories of God's will. The first of which is his moral will or revealed will. This is the moral standards and scriptures that God has laid out for us so to indicate how we are to conduct ourselves if we are to act rightly before him. This starts with the Ten Commandments and goes throughout of uh, the New Testament. So turn with me to Romans 2, 14 to 16. This reads, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do, do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So Paul is specifically speaking about persons who are not Christians. Paul is saying that these people who have not been specifically taught the moral law of God, understand right from wrong, consistent with God's law. In verse 15, he points out that they know right and wrong because the moral law of God is written on the hearts of every man and woman. God has given each person this law written on their hearts and a conscience that bears witness to the law, thereby restraining the evil within a person. The God-given conscience will, uh, within a person, is in conflict with the sin nature uh, that's in every man. Because the unregenerate man does not have the power to overcome the slavery of sin, at best, the conscience can overcome the sin nature for, temporarily. An unregenerate person can act morally and ethically in some things for a season, but they are still under the power of their sin. If they allow their sinful nature to prevail frequently enough, the conscience becomes seared, and now the sin nature overwhelms the influence of the conscience and provides an excuse for sin. We must remember that no matter how moral or ethical an unregenerate person is, each man will stand before Christ and be judged on that day of judgment, and no one can live up to the righteousness of Christ. The fact that there was this conflict between the sin nature and conscience, conscience within each person testifies that they knew the moral will of God. So they have no excuse that they did not understand right from wrong. And on that day, each person will be judged, and if they do not have the righteousness of Christ, they cannot use the defense that they did not know what the law of God was. The, secondary, the second category of God's will is his providential will or secret will. 
This is his plan for everything in history. It was ordained to come to pass from the beginning of time. This includes all of history from creation to eternity. The greatest event of which is the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for the sins of men. But God has ordained events that are both good and bad times. Lamentations 3, 37 to 38 said, Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not, for the mouth, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? God has providential plan for each person that was, and that plan was made before they were born. Although God allows evil and bad times to come, as we mentioned earlier, he does not cause man to sin. God does not cause evil to occur. He allows man to express the innate evil and sin within him when it serves his purpose. James 1, 13 to 15 says, Let no one, when he is tempted, say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. When it is fully grown, brings forth death. All men have a sin nature and have a predisposition to doing evil, even after salvation. We have the vestiges of sin within us until we are glorified. God, as an expression of his common grace, has suppressed the evil in man's heart, so we're not as evil as we can be. However, he does allow man to express evil at times to bring about his will. God knows what is best for us in each circumstances. Now, we've been talking about God's will today. This is the expression of his sovereign desire for events to occur as he predestined them to occur. In Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, it says, Remember this and stand firm. Recall to mind you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. So what is God's will? It's to accomplish his purpose. So that brings up the question, what's God's purpose? God's purpose in all things is to bring glory to himself. Everything that God does brings him glory. What he does for us individually brings him glory. We benefit because we are his children. That means that he directs our good times and our bad times. He blesses us and chastises us all for his glory. 1 Chronicles 16, 23 to 31 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare the glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all people. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and he is to be held in awe above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. All that God has created declares his glory. He works in the lives of men and women for his glory. So everything that happens to us, we need to consider that God has done it for his glory and not for our self-centered view, which is, God loves us and does this only because he loves us. There is a worldview today, even in Christianity, where it's all about us. Man is the center of of religion. In In the truth of the gospel is that we live and we exist, and everything that God does for us is for his glory and his glory alone. So what are some... In closing here, what are some applications that we can take away today? First of all, don't be afraid. 
Scripture tells us that our sovereign Lord watches over us at all times and in all places. He provides for us and directs us under his loving care. Jesus told us that if God is concerned about the sparrow, why wouldn't he be concerned about us who mean so much more to him? There's no need for fear because God protects us. David in his Psalms speaks multiple times about his, um, his security in the sovereign protection of the Lord. In, in Psalm 4, 8, it says, In peace I will bo- both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I also encourage you to read Psalm 91. For time's sake, we won't go there, but it declares David's confidence in the shelter and protection of the, law, in the, of the Lord. We are never to fear because we have a sovereign God who watches over us at all times. Secondly, all that we have is from God. We know that all good things come from the Lord. We are to give him thanks for for everything we have. And whatever he gives us, we are not to have pride in. Because the Lord does give and he does take away. And all of it that he gives us serves one purpose, which is to, to bring him glory. We are to remember God is with us in good times and bad times. We are not to doubt his continued oversight and protection, whether we're in good times or difficult times. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, and always acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. We are not to rely on our own wisdom, which is flawed. We are to seek guidance from God in all that we do. He has a plan for each one of us, although we usually can't see the end or the outcome of the plan that he has for us at the time. We need to trust him that he has our best interest in heart. We are are finite beings who cannot understand the mind of God, and scripture tells us that his ways are not our ways. We are to trust him and trust him only. Even when we suffer for a while, we will come through according to his will and will have gained steadfastness in our faith. Our understanding of the sovereignty of God and his, prob- and his promises to preserve us make us respond differently to trials than the rest of the world. When we go through difficult times, we're not to have self-pity. We are not to complain, but we are to declare our trust in the Lord. And as a result, our response proclaims the glory of God to the world. And there is, the fourth thing is there's no such thing as chance or luck. All things come to pass through the providence of God. Fate, luck, and chance are just words used by the world to deny the sovereignty of God. What, would, what is more random than rolling a pair of dice? God tells us that he is even in the rolling of a pair of dice. Back in ancient times, if, if you remember the book of Esther, when Haman cast lots, which is the same as rolling dice, for, I can't remember, like for a year to figure out the exact day when he should plan to, to eliminate the Jews. Well, as Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but, in every deci- but it's every decision but it's every decision is from the Lord. So even the most random acts that man thinks is just chance or luck is, occurs because of the will of God. Lastly, we are to acknowledge God in everything we do and everything we plan. We are to praise him for what we have and the opportunities that were presented to us. Everything that has happened in our lives up until this moment and everything that will occur from this time forward will occur according to his plan as certain, certainly as we know that he is God. He has planned everything for us and it will all come to pass. We are, to not, we are not to be presumptuous and to, and to make plans without seeking the, the will of God. And we are to say, as scripture tells us, uh, God willing when we make plans because our entire lives are planned out and controlled by him. So as we go forth today from this place, let's be ever aware that God is with us, guiding and directing our lives no matter what we face. His plans are for good and not for evil. We are to be deliberate in seeking his counsel as we go forward and to be ever mindful that all we have and all that we experience are from him. 
We are to praise him for all that he has done for us. And may our lives, our words, and our praise and our, and our actions bring praise and glory to him forever. Amen? Amen. Okay, Pr- uh, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word. Lord, we uh, at this time acknowledge that you are sovereign over all things. We are not here today by, because of any other reason other than that you have willed us to be here. Lord, may we continue to ponder the thought and the truth that you control every aspect of our lives, that you have been involved in our knitting together in our mother's womb, and you will be with us through eternity. Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless the work of these, uh, this body of believers. Lord, may you continue to let us grow closer to you through the study of your word, through prayer, and through singing praises. And Lord, may everything we do bring you honor and glory as you truly deserve. And we pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.